And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. He is the community manager for Mage Hand Press, the, ha the hand of Vecna that, that is always talking in sign language. And the and the and the man who pushes more than just a found than, than an invisible five pound amount of force, and and is and is currently and is and is helping spearhead the up the upcoming starter kit for Dark Matter, the one and only Justin Forkner. How you doing today, man? I'm doing all right. Glad to be here. Yeah. Uh, glad yeah. glad to have you on. Um, Thank you. So I'll, I'll start with the humble beginnings, as it were. Okay. Um, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? All right, so uh, my first introduction to role-playing games, I didn't realize uh, I was doing it, but I was actually making role-playing games back in, like, fifth grade. I, I would, you know, make little rules, like, you know, uh, Star Trek or Star Wars, you know, uh, fleet commander type games, essentially. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, eventually I stopped doing this and kind of like moved away from like um, silly uh, game design uh, for a while. And then back in 2004, freshman in high school, uh, someone tells me, hey, you should go to the RPG club. And I'm thinking, oh, hey, cool. Like I like um, Final Fantasy and you know, all those other JRPGs on the PlayStation. So, yeah, I'll, I'll check this out. Go in, and they're like, all right, here's a character sheet. Let's uh, let's get you a character made. What is this? And a uh, week later, I'm, I'm addicted. I, I'm meeting multiple times a week to play with different groups, and that was 3.5, and just played all throughout high school and into college. And eventually once fifth edition rolled around, I um, encountered Mage Hand Press and uh, in the middle of that Kickstarter, the two years ago uh, for the first dark matter ended up uh, joining the team as the community manager to help with the uh, marketing and social media. All right. Yeah. And um, was it, was it a case where you had, where you had approached where you had approached them or was it the other way around? Oh, yeah. No, I approached them. I was a fan that wanted to make sure that the book got funded. Because originally, uh, the Dark Matter campaign, we were two weeks into the campaign, and it was clearly not going to be funded. So I messaged Mike and was just like, hey, here's like this 10-step social plan to uh, make sure that the, the book gets to be made. Because I really want it. And they didn't follow uh, the little plan I structured out for them and they, they stuck to not having any social media presence whatsoever. And then, so if you, like a day or two later, I'm like, all right, hey, I understand 10 steps. That's, that might be a lot. You know, y'all are busy with like writing and design and stuff. Here's, here's a five-step plan. Nothing changed. Uh, so eventually I'm just kind of like, hey, look, you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot. I really want this Kickstarter made. Like, if you're not going to do the social media, just please let me. Please let me do it. And I don't know why, but Mike said okay. And I started managing the social, built the uh, social media presence from nothing to uh, what it is today, and uh, helped get the book funded, hitting all of those social goals that we had uh, the first time around, as well as the uh, financial stretch goals as well. Now, it was a lot more humble of a project the all of the stretch goals didn't exceed uh, 40,000 that time around mm -hmm. but hey you know we we hit them all going from not going to get funded to that so that was a pretty big accomplishment uh, i think and then uh they were so happy with my performance they kept me on all right and yeah now first now first off when it comes to when it came, when it comes to uh, dark matter, since that since that ended up being kind of the patient zero of the of this whole adventure, um, mm -hmm. 
Now, Dark Matter, as I understand it, is a, um, is a science fiction adaptation of 5th edition's toolbox that mm -hmm. is leaning more in the space opera -y think things. Um, more in more in the realm of more in the realm of Star Wars than say um th than say the Expanse. Um. What 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 was it about Dark Matter that hooked you? Um. So. What hooked me about Dark Matter was it was finally something to play other than fantasy. Um. And like it didn't throw out everything that existed in 5e already uh because like there's there's a lot of people who've done sci-fi 5e and like not knocking what they they're offering but for me i wanted i still wanted to be able to play like a space wizard or space druid or space barbarian um and and telling me that i've got to throw away the you know these hundreds of dollars worth of books that i've spent because my the stuff that's already been written doesn't play nice with what they've written uh just didn't jive with me uh, personally. Mm -hmm. So uh, when Dark Matter was announced and I saw it uh, from someone who I already trusted because I was already a fan of Matrian Press at that time, um, it it was a very easy sell for me. Um, because, like, you know, if, if I want to set up a game where it's, it's pure sci-fi, no fantasy, I mean, it's not hard to throw out... Uh, you know, say to the players, hey, don't play wizards and bards and stuff. Uh, just play, you know, the rogue, the artificer, uh, things like that. Um, with the... Uh, but if I want to incorporate fantasy, I still have that option. Like, you can, you know, you could take an entire fantasy party that's already together, um, you know, crash a spaceship in front of them, and they can take off into space, and it works just fine. Uh, or you can have, you know, some people who are fantasy, some people who are sci-fi, uh, some people who are somewhere in between, and, like, it's still work. So it's very easily adaptable to different styles of gameplay without um, forcing any one particular hand. All right, that, um, that definitely makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now... When it now, when it comes to when it comes to that, you mentioned compa you mentioned compatibility. Um, mm -hmm. For somebody who's jumping it, who's jumping in from the to this from um, from vanilla five e, would there be would there be certain um, race class combos that would technically fit, but they might require a bit more require a bit more leg work than others? No, not really. I mean, like we we actually specifically say that uh, more or less every race, like we don't include lore for every single race in Vanilla Five E because not all of them are in the SRD. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then there's certain limitations on what what we can and can't acknowledge regarding that. But um, ultimately, we can, you know, we we can kind of like leave little notes that say, hey, you know. Uh, you know, there's there's definitely Dragonborn in 5e, whether we mention them or not. Uh, it's just a matter of we can't necessarily, you know, there's only so much we can necessarily say about that. Um, but, you know, if you wanted to play Dragonborn and wanted to play a, a Barbarian or you wanted to play a, a Gadgeteer, it's absolutely fine. Um, you just, you know, make up a character story just like you would otherwise. Oh, all right. Mm -hmm. Now, now one of the things I, now I did end up grabbing the, um, core, the core book for it. And that's definitely helped, um, mm -hmm. provide some, provide some prep, provide a su sufficient amount of, um, preparation on the matter. Mm -hmm. Um, like when it comes to the, now, with different campaign settings, they'll often emphasize different um, play styles. Mm -hmm. Do you can do you consider dark matter to be a general sandbox, or do you, or are there certain styles of play that you think um, it's going to favor more than others? Um, I I would consider it a um, sandbox personally, and I think that the adventures that we have written for it so far kind of prove that. So. 
we've written the first chapter of Grax's Club now uh, since it got funded. Mm-hmm. And it's a big game hunt where you're trying to... Uh, the first chapter is called uh, the most dangerous or da- uh, most dangerous or game, something like that. And <laughs> nice reference. what it is, is yeah. Um, and you're chasing a giant space ferret and trying to take it down before a mer- rival mercenary crew does. Um, and then we have the starter adventure kit conspiracy in the stars, which is more of like political intrigue, mystery investigation type. So, um, and then, you know, we're, we're in the process of writing a um, mecha adventure, which is going to be inspired uh, in part by Apocalypse Now, Gundam, Wing, and all your favorite, you know, mecha stuff. So, like, Dark Matter is incredibly flexible, where you're, you're going to be able to play whatever game you want to play. Um, we included about 30-ish, 40-ish pages of lore in the core book originally, because... Uh, we wanted to make sure that the lore was substantial enough that it can accommodate whatever it is, um, you know, like someone wanting to have something to go off of, but didn't want it to be so um, controlling and oppressive to the story that it's like it requires you to only play one way. Um, and that was that was something that we spent a lot of time doing. And... I think you're going to see that as you as you dive through the book. There's enough. There's enough story. There's an, there's enough uh, tidbits on you know how different characters or different races and factions and things play together uh, that if you want you know something to rely on, you've got it. But there's also enough like open space for you to create your own stories mm-hmm. and do what you want. If that makes sense, I I think I I think I can go with that. Yeah. Now, when it comes now, um, one of the other things that I did that I did note, um, is the is when it came to um ships. Now, okay, ship creation and ship combat has always been a tr- has always been a tricky thing to handle in role playing mm-hmm. games in general, and um. In role-playing games, using the D and D toolkit, um, especially, mm-hmm. and this this is not me um, edition bashing. I want I want to make clear because previous editions have had just as much issue um, mm-hmm. within the past. Yeah. Um, and what I'm cur- what I'm curious about was when you was um, from your perspective, what were some of the th- what were some of the things that they wanted to focus on with um, with sh- with the way ships worked in dark matter and yeah, to so, avoid some of those pitfalls. So one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we did with ships, and I, I think we did a pretty decent job uh, is, you know, fifth edition is ultimately very simple, easy to pick up. Um, you know, there's, there's depth to it, but it's certainly not like, it's not like 3.5 where, you know, you're punished for not knowing you know the ins and outs of every single little thing. You're not no. You're, uh, you're not um, keelhauled for not knowing the secret handshake. Exactly, and so one of the things that we did to try and make it as as easy as possible is we limited player action to uh, one one action per instead of move bonus and action, just because mm-hmm. it it just makes things run a lot smoother when everyone's operating one action on the same initiative. Um, and what that allows for uh, things to do is like that, you know, now combat moves very quickly, uh, like 5e should. And it's picked up, you know, if after you've played in Starship Combat like once, uh, you more or less know what you should be doing and what role, like in your role. Mm-hmm. Um, just like in 5e, like, you know, you you go through one or two, you know, fights and you know what you're doing, you know? So it's like the captain knows, Hey, if I say fire at will, that empower the gunner to take an, um, if I, if as the, uh, engineer, I opt to, um, you know, put the ship into overdrive, 
then that's going to, you know, uh, overcharge like the shields and the ships and the guns and everything. And that's kind of like, um, you know, just a way that they can interact with everything. I, re- uh, I really sincerely hope that mm-hmm. during playtesting, nobody who was playing the engineer tried to do a Scottish accent. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to say I didn't do it. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I've, I've definitely, definitely played Scotty at least once in playtesting. Well, I suppose, I suppose it could be worse. You could, you could be subject to the wharf principle. Yeah, it's true. Um, I'm pretty sure whoever loved playing fighter ended up getting stuck with that and Worf's propensity for getting his ass kicked. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the fighters do really well on the guns mm-hmm. because, uh, you know, like, the guns technically operate off of the same principles that a character sheet does, so if you have something like extra shot, um, or, sorry, extra attack, then suddenly you get to do that as a, you know, on a spaceship gun instead. Uh, so we we made sure that even the fighter feels useful on a spaceship. Yeah. And that's 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 one of those things that um I can al- I can always see being tr- being tricky whenever because um a common approach that I see with um handling space combat is mm-hmm. is doing the concept of um one ship and every player being a separate um, division of that of that part, you know, one person gunning, one person um, pi- mm-hmm. piloting, one person engineering, one person yeah. um, si- science, or the dirty tactics, depending on how you want to look mm-hmm. at it, and so on. Mm-hmm. But um, whenever I see that done in practice, there's always a lot of arguing about who's going to put what role and who's out getting coffee. Yeah, and. It, that's something where it's like it's it's one of those tricky things where that's definitely kind of I'm not going to say it's necessarily it's the approach we took was you know everyone has you know one role on one ship mm-hmm. unless of course you choose to be a dogfighter uh, which then you're in a you know separate fighter ship yourself but you know barring that example the you know, it feels appropriate for the the ship to be manned by, you know, a crew of players. But he, it was very important that we didn't have that, the coffee situation, uh, mm-hmm. per se. Um, which a lot of, a lot of people fall into that trap uh, when yeah. they're designing things. Yeah, I've, um, an old friend of mine once described, um, once described um, game design as play, as playing a game of Minesweeper, except the except the mines are real and also you're on fire. <laughs> Which um, that's a bit that's a bit harsher than I would have put it personally, but I can see I can see his point. Mm-hmm. Um, now one now because of the fact that this is a science fiction slash science fantasy, I'm. Whether whether or not you um, classify it as science fantasy, I'll leave up to you. Mm-hmm. But oh, we, I mean, we consider it science fantasy personally. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. I'm getting. I'm guessing that the term sci-fi is just is just used because that's e- because that's easier for people to uh, draw from. Um, oh yeah, definitely. But there's always a certain when it come whenever it comes to adapting. Um, the rules from a fantasy game into sci-fi. There's always that elephant in the room regarding how magic works within the uh, lore. Mm-hmm. How have, how have you guys tackled it? Uh, well, we just uh, took Arthur C. Clarke's quote and we reversed it. So instead of it being you know te- uh, magic is in, you know sufficiently advanced technologies indistinguishable from magic. It's a uh, sufficiently advanced magic is indistinguishable from technology. So firearms are advanced uh, ones. Uh, ships are powered by uh, dark matter engines that wizards can recharge with spell slots uh, and all sorts of things like that. So you end up getting uh, technology and magic ultimately working the same as one another in a lot of ways. Which. I'd say that's interesting because a lot of times when you see this sort of thing, 
they end up being mm-hmm. adversarial to one each other to one another. Mm-hmm. another. Um, the big example for that for me will always be Amethyst, and while I let, while I got no I got no beef with Chris Diaz, and I and I like his stuff. Um, I don't want that mm-hmm. approach to be the assumption. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, I mean, like, it's fun when technology and magic don't get along, uh, but at the same time, you know, you, you don't always want that. And one of the things that we wanted, like, we've always done with everything that we've ever released, is it's it's always been an attempt to expand rather than replace things in 5e. Um, so if we were if we were having technology and magic fight one another, it would have gone against kind of like Mage Hand Press's uh, core business model um i guess is how i would put that yeah i can i can get behind Mm -hmm. that now when it comes now um and of and of course that can that can that can apply that can apply across the across the uh, board um Mm -hmm. when it comes to the gadgeteer which is the new class exclusive to dark Mm -hmm. matter um, mm-hmm. was there ever debate about whether or not the gadgeteer should count as a, um, as a, as a subclass or whether it should be its own thing? Oh. Um, so we started with making base classes. Um, so before I joined the team, you know, years ago, though, that everyone ended up kind of like meeting was on Giant in the Playground, uh, where they were designing, you know, subclasses and base classes together and, um, you know, just kind of having, you know, kind of just brewer fun. Mm-hmm. So we, I mean, at this point, I think we've made like nine or 10 base classes between all of us. And that that's just kind of uh, something that, you know, we, we've never been afraid to do. And so you're, you're not going to see us shine away from making... Uh, a base a base class because yeah there's plenty of times that a subclass will do just fine but I, I think that the artificer which we wrote the gadget here before the artificer was actually out but you know the artificer proves that there's definitely certain concepts where you can't just do a subclass mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now when for in your the way you uh, see it, where is the um, line? Like where, like where, where would be what would be the dividing line between this idea works better as a subclass versus this idea works better as a class? Uh, it's a question of broadness. So, for example, uh, like our methodology is kind of always like X the class. So, for the gadgeteer, it's. Um, utility the class uh for the gunslinger it's i mean you know it's equal parts guns the class and uh crits the class um there you know so you you just kind of like go through things and you ask you know can you say that something is this the class yes or no and then you follow it up with can i come up with uh eight to twelve legitimate subclass options for this concept. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if the answer is no, you can't come up with eight subclasses for that base class, then uh, it probably doesn't need to be a base class. Um, Like, uh, for example, the, there is, there's a subclass that I've been, or base class that I had been trying to uh, get done and that was all about like clones and minions and stuff, but ultimately it's consistently had this problem of like, I can't come up with eight legitimate, you know, subclasses uh, for this concept. And so for now it's being set aside and I might retool it as a series of subclasses for other classes because, you know, clone mechanics are fun, but it turns out not exactly ideal for, um, putting out uh, a full base class. Well, at the very and, least, you, know, you won't have to hear any weird owl jokes out of it. <laughs> I am fairly yeah. certain you've heard a few. 
Yep. No, uh, I, th- I definitely have heard some references to uh, Agent Smith from Matrix. Uh, I think I'm a clone now from Weird Al. A uh, few others. <laughs> um, prob- probably a few, probably a few Star Wars jokes because the probability I... of making a Star Wars joke among nerds with an- with enough time approaches one. Yeah. Um, yeah, gotta. I mean, I yeah, I've definitely heard references to Palpatine as well. <laughs> I wasn't even going to go with that. I was going to go with Captain Rex. Yeah, also true. Oh. Yeah. Uh, gosh. <laughs> now, the other... Now, when it comes to... Um, now, this is another lore question, but when it comes to space travel, when it, com- when it comes mm-hmm. to interstellar travel within, um, dar- within Dark Matter's universe... Um, mm-hmm. Do you see it as a do you see it as a case of um of tr- of free form of free form high speed travel with the whole dark matter engine, or are we dealing with a case of um travel only between specific points like in say fading suns or wing commander? So, um, per the official rules of dark matter, uh, which I've always been you know a fan of the DM flex. So if the DM wants to run a different way with this, they're more than welcome to. Um, it's, you can do blind jumps or you can rely on the moths. Now the blind jumps, you know, they're riskier. You have a chance of not ending up where you wanted to go in the first place, uh, based on the percentile role. You can do certain things to mitigate that. Um, like, um, uh, uh, ingesting something called the roaches, which essentially they're, they're space drugs that make you good at astrogation. Uh, that are also quite literally a space roach. So you can you can get high on space roaches and get good at astrogation. Um, you or you can go through the maws, or you can just take a blind jump and, and pray. The, ro- um, the roaches, and for whatever reason, are reminding me of Dune. They should. Um, there something that's uh, real fun about dark matter is there's references to everything. And we have like a red shirt stat block. We've got um, a definitely not Millennium Falcon spaceship. Uh, we've got legally distinct Gundams and laser swords. Uh, so you know it's like there's there's a whole lot of fun um, homages to all of our favorite uh, sci-fi. You know, funness. Yeah, and um, since you mentioned mechs, and since some since some of the people in the temple are big mech fans, mm-hmm. let me get let me get the obvious question out of the way regarding regarding mechs: Stompy, okay. Spiky, or both? Uh, both. There's there's options for all sorts of different mechs, and uh, when 100 Oni comes out, uh, there's going to be even more. And when when it comes to when it comes to the sizes of them, I'm get I'm guessing that it ra- it ranges from straight up power armor to, all the way up to um all all the way up to the standard size for good old R- good the good old RX seventy eight. Oh yeah. So I mean, if you want if you want to run, um, you know, a s- spaceship. And when I say spaceship size, I'm, I'm referring to the dark matter uh, spaceship classification. Like, there's certainly ones that are that big. There's also magic items that function as like Titan frames and uh, things like that. If you're, you know, if you've played, uh, why why am I blanking on the name of, of the game? Uh, Titanfall. Yep, Titanfall. So, yeah, you, you can play mechs of many different sizes. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and I, part of the, part of the reason I, I will admit that part of the reason I end up bringing up the whole stompy or spiky debate is, sim- is simply because, um, a good friend of mine has been slandering my good name by claiming that I prefer stompy to spiky <laughs> <laughs> just because I made a f- just because I made a few battle tech memes involving, um, involving the oxymoron that is Steiner scouting. Mm-hmm. But it's it's technically still scouting if anybody if all the targets that you were scouting are no longer alive. 
Yeah, just like in uh, Hitman, you know, it's it's uh, it's stealth if no one sees you, <laughs> if no one's alive to see you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. Because there's there's the right way to do orbital insertion, and then there's the the wrong way, and then there's the Steiner way, which is the wrong way, but we <laughs> drop more assault mechs. <laughs> um. But that that's always that's always been a um. A bit, there's always been a bit of debate on that about whether, when it comes to bringing in science fiction within, um, ro- within role-playing games, because some games will go, the, some games that are more cultured will go the, um, will go the spiky mech, mm-hmm. and of course, when I say spiky, I'm talking about the highly maneuverable power armor esque um, st- styles that you'd see out of Gundam or mm-hmm. or um, Macross. I'm not calling it Robotech. Um, <laughs> Harmony Gold can go screw themselves. And mm-hmm. the Stompy, of course, is the is the is the ones with the more tank like aesthetic. Your your um ba- your battle techs and the like. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we we've, we've definitely got both. Um, like I said, and you know, it, it's it's fun to have both because there's definitely people who want to play you know, Mech Warrior or um, Battletech, and there's other people who want to play Gundam and, uh, and Zoids and stuff. Uh, I mean, heck, we, we even have a fusion mech, which may or may not be a reference to Grun Lagan. Um, oh, boy. Here, here we go. <laughs> hey, um, we're going to combine? They're going to combine. <laughs> oh, boy. Here we go with this again. <laughs> um. But the the way the way you describe it, um, I definitely get the vibe that um, that the development team with Dark Matter is not averse to putting what some might call dumb shit within the within the uh, book. Oh yeah, and I mean like uh, so I mean I'm, I actually got to design some stuff for Dark Matter because uh, the book wasn't written at the time, or mm-hmm. part of it was written, uh, mm-hmm. and like. You know, my biggest contribution to Dark Matter is uh, the Wismos, which are uh, tiny one-inch robots that are basically, if you took uh, the minions from Despicable Me 3, or like any of the Despicable Me series, and Big Hero 6, um, uh, the microbots from there, and made them into one unholy abomination, you have, uh, you have the Wismos. So you have these tiny self-replicating robots causing chaos, and just like a gray render can imprint on somebody, these uh, Wismos can imprint on someone and declare them their master. And as handy as they can be, they're also inherently drawn towards chaos. And, you know, sometimes that means, uh, you know, you ask for a grenade, they bring you an apple. Sometimes they actually bring you with the grenade. And, uh, sometimes the grenade's got the pin pulled on it. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when it come now, um, when it came to the description on the Kickstarter page for the mm-hmm. um, for for the starter set, um, mm-hmm. now some now some of the inspirations I ca- I kind of saw coming, and I think mm-hmm. I think it's made been made pretty clear with them, you know, Star Wars, Hitchhiker's Guide, The Expanse, but um, one mm-hmm. of them that uh, made me tilt my head a little bit with all with all of this, it, of all things, was. Was saying that you, that an influence was Doom, and I'll get this yep. out of the way. I hope to God it wasn't Doom Three. Um, no, it was just it was uh, I mean, just Doom in general, honestly. Mm-hmm. So like uh, one, you know, one of the fun things uh, that you can fight in Doom in uh, Dark Matter are Mecha Demons. So you know, you've got these these horrific combinations of uh, robot and uh, you know, demon mm-hmm. that you can fight, which is definitely very clearly influenced by um, Doom. We also have, you know, kind of our own take on the BFG. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's all sorts of different little references like that that you can find um, from a variety of series here I, um, in Dark I, Matter. I just hope that nobody tries to run a campaign that um, is taking notes from the maps that were used in the Plutonia experiment because I can't go back. <laughs> I can't. I can't go back to fi- to um, firing squads of hit scanners and way 
way too many skeletons. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just, I'm just. Are there, are there hotter, are there harder Doom wads now? Yeah, but um, mm-hmm. Doom, but um, the but Plutonia has a special place for how much it kicked my ass because it because mm. of all all the chain gunners that were that um would t- would kill you in seconds if you didn't know what you were doing and way way too many arch files in mean, one arch <laughs> one arch and um one arch file is bad enough imagine having to deal with two or three of them yeah no thanks <laughs> um, i I'll pass on that. <laughs> i like li- i like living mhm <laughs> yeah, yeah i can agree with that statement you know, yeah. it, it's nice to be alive and not, uh, not just constantly getting murdered by those. Things. Yeah. Um, but when it came, when it came to the starter set, who, who pit who was that something that was always being being considered to be developed, or was that somebody something that um somebody within the team pitched? Uh, so I pitched it. Um, because when we were at a number of different conventions. Uh, we encountered this thing where people wanted to play Dark Matter. They loved the art. They loved the lore, um, this, that, or the other. But then, you know, they realized, oh, hey, this is, this is a D&D product, and I don't own the, you know, 150-something dollars worth of D&D books, you know, out there. Um, so we wanted to provide a way for people to play dark matter that have never played five E and, you know, they may or may not be wanting to support wizards right now. Um, and, uh, or just like maybe the books are too expensive for them, things like that. Uh, and just an easy introduction to D and D in space. Um, so that was, that was kind of how that came to be, but we also wanted to make sure that if we were going to do a starter kit, that it would be something that would also have value for the veteran players. So things like the DM screen um, and even like the, the dark matter basic rules are, uh, were designed yes to, you know, help lead new players into, uh, you know, understanding the rules of the game, but also are really good for veteran players to function as kind of a, um quick reference guide because i I don't know if you've ever encountered the problem where your table's only so big but everyone wants to have their books at the table so you've got you know uh 10 stacks of you know comically large books i actually um i actually came up with a worker workaround for that but i am well Mm -hmm. aware that i'm only one person with this yeah I I went and because of the fact that I um I have a rule where I kept where I cap everything off at four players. Mm-hmm. I went I went and bought four really cheap netbooks, and when I say cheap, I mean they. This only this cost me just under two hundred bucks to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had, and I um I had preload I had preloaded them with um the with the PDFs that were going to be necessary. Which mm-hmm. involved a lot of USB USB um, j- jumping bet- jumping between between each, yeah. and the and um when it came to game time, I'd have the map set up, I'd have my screen set up, and then I'd ha- and then I'd um I'd have the um um netbooks set up, um, mm-hmm. and the sole purpose the sole purpose of the netbooks was so that people could have something to look up. Um, mm-hmm. Occasionally I'd have them hooked up to my Wi-Fi and, um, you, and use a unified index that I had, I had set up so that everybody could look up. Um, and keep mm-hmm. in mind, this was, before, um, this was before certain places like Roll20 were do, would do that anyways. Mm-hmm. But I nev- even with those, I never used it because of the fact that I was always using some sort of third-party or home brewery stuff. So yeah. I need so, but um, I always made sure to have a very clear understanding about what homebrew is getting used. But mm-hmm. I am I am well aware that that's just one example, and that's just how I handled it. Mm-hmm. But it, de- yeah. it definitely is a um, it definitely is, it def- definitely is a problem. Mm-hmm. I the advice that I've always given people to try and to try and work around that is pregame as hard as you can. Mm-hmm. Like pregame, like you're going to the Super Bowl. 
Mm-hmm. But I can I can see how that'd be a problem because there's even even these days there's still this assumption that you need a bunch of different book you need a bunch of different books. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So with with people you know kind of feeling that they need to you know have all of these books and stuff, um, having it set up to where you can have like a quick reference guide like now now you don't need uh you know maybe you still need one copy of dark matter uh at the table so that like you know because there there is a lot of stuff in dark matter that's not in the base rules um, because obviously it's stripped down um but like by and large like all of you know the most important parts of dark matter are in that that's i think it's 60 something pages and so that allows people to, uh, you know, have these, uh, you know, books at the table, you know, for, for themselves so that can either A, easily be passed around or B, you know, everyone can have their own um, that aren't taking up just entirely too much space. Whereas, you know, if everyone like, you know, I hope that every player buys dark matter because, you know, obvious, you know, obvious reason, but, you know, I understand why it's not ideal for there to be that many copies at one table. And yeah, the, we designed it so that it's good for learning. It's also good for um, quick reference guide. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And just out of curiosity, when you were showing the game at um, conventions, mm-hmm. um, did you did you ever put together whip together like a um, primer for, um, for uh, demo tables? So uh, we we put together a primer in the sense that we we had or so we, we had pre-made characters that were available for people that included all of the rules that you needed to know for each character. Mm-hmm. Um, but it didn't necessarily hmm, let me, I, we didn't have like a, you know, a unified rule uh, PDF or you know printout in place at that time. All right, that ma- that um that makes mm-hmm. sense. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. when now when it comes to um when. It, when it comes to when it comes to this this particular start this particular starter set now you've got you've got the basic rules um, some spell cards which I'm let I I'm, which are basically the reincarnation of those index cards we all had starting out <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but the but the big thing that I want to talk talk about is the conspiracy in the stars adventure now um, first off. When you when when this when that was um when that was being gray boxed, um did you always intend for it to run between third to fifth level and why that level range specifically? Um and so admittedly this that may or may not have been a mistake to in start at third level. Um but we we did plan for it starting at third level um right from the get go because uh, for the most part that's when most players that I'm aware of start playing the game because, you know, maybe, you know, like the newest of new players uh, do start at level one uh, a lot because, you know, they, you know, baby steps Uh, and, you know, learning new mechanics and stuff. But after you've played, you know, one or two sessions, you're, you're probably ready for level three and subclasses and things like that. And quite frankly, that's where like all of the most fun parts of D and D start coming into play for fifth edition is once you start to make those big choices. Um, so to accommodate the newer players, we do have the pre-made characters with all of that information written out for uh, for them. Um, but you know, for everyone who's played D and D before, we start at level three because we want players to enjoy playing this this adventure and it's kind of as simple as that 
Now, when it, now in the in within that within that one one of the things that I'm that I'm curious about is a lot of times with um st with starter kits or the like, there's usually um a set of pre gen characters. Did you follow mm -hmm. along that, or is or is that not in this? Well, like I said, there are pre gen characters. Mm -hmm. um, so we are going to have a total of six different characters for people to choose from. Um, that are some of them are going to be classes that people are very familiar with, um, you know, like the cleric and the bard and things like that. And then others are going to be some of the classes that we've made over the years, like the um, like the gadgeteer. Uh, I know that there's a gunslinger one. Um, and yeah, so we're, there's going to be a mix of classes that people have never seen before if they if they're not familiar with Mage Chain Press, and then there's going to be some that people are going to be very familiar with because they've been playing D and D five E for years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And within now, the other thing is the is doing a neo noir story now. Mm -hmm. I'm no stranger to film to film noir, and I've ta I've talked about it in one form or another for years here in the mm -hmm. temple. But what I'm curious about is why why neo no why neo noir was it be was it because it might be a bit of a stretch to do full on full on huge space battles in a starter kit, or was there another reason why you went with that particular style for it? Um, we went with that spirit particular style um, because it's actually a great um, storytelling style to incorporate um, all of the elements of sci-fi in, in one fell swoop. So there's, you know, instead of a car chase, there's definitely a space battle instead of uh, it's like you get to explore the CD bars of this port and, you know, kind of see, you know, you can you get to have your like uh, Star Wars Cantina moment, um, and you get to have your space battle, which you could reference. You know, any number of sci-fi there. Um, there's this mystery about this weird tech that you know is you know fresh off the boat. Uh, so like, there's there's all sorts of things that you can do in in noir that allow you to uh, showcase all of the cool things in sci-fi um, in a, a more compressed story. Because with this being a starter adventure, um, it, it is a little bit shorter than, say, uh, you know, like how uh, Dragons of uh, Ice Spire Peak mm -hmm. was, you know, a fairly short adventure um, that was designed to try and, like... Uh, quickly touch base on all of the different pillars of D&D. &D. Um, you know, and I'll leave that up to you to decide, you know, how successful they they were in that. But um, in Noir, it's it's easy to accomplish that in a way that feels natural. Yeah. Um, and also it's just fun. I will admit that the I will admit that the cover for some reason made me think that there was going to be a bit of, especially with the intrigue part of it made me think that there was going to be a bit of dipping into James Bond, which the idea of James Bond in space is not, is not something that I'm going to say no to. I mean, one of my favorite, mm -hmm. one of my favorite SF, SF anime in the, in the early two thousands was the reboot of space adventure Cobra. I'm not familiar with that one, admittedly. Um, that was the anime that ended up providing the inspiration for Dante, you know, De um, Devil May Cry Dante. Okay. Um, yep, that I am familiar with. It start. It it was it was a it was a, a decent deal in the, in the seventies and apparently a really big deal in France. Um, mm -hmm. Then in the um, in 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 the uh, late in the late aughts it got a couple it got a couple ov it got a couple OVAs, and then it got mm -hmm. one then it got one half season, you know, thirteen mm -hmm. episodes. Um, it's um yeah. it's definitely an, it's definitely an interesting approach and it's it's very it's very pulpy in the, mm -hmm. in that old, in that old school weird tales kind of way mm -hmm. where if you t if you want uh, and in some in some ways it's got a, it's got a few things in common with some, with um 
some of the jet, some of the jet set tr um, globe trotting that you'd see in, say, Lupin the Third. Mm -hmm. um, because it's it's more about the hero going from place to place and and dealing with whatever whatever is in that particular area that they just happen to stumble into. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And that's that's of course a big oversimplification, but that's that's one of the main approach. And of and of course he has a gun. He had, we can't we can't have a seventies anime without having somebody with a gun for an arm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm not I'm not entirely sure. Kami has never said what what exactly he saw in that to provide the inspiration for Dante, but it's. A th but it's a thing, and obviously he's not going to talk to me. <laughs> he's too he's too busy calling everybody idiots. Fair enough. Um, now, the other thing that the other thing that I was cur was curious about is this um is this deluxe box that you have as one as one of the mouse as one of the um one of the tier one of the tiered rewards. Um, mm -hmm. Is this the first time that you've worked with Level Up Dice, or have you worked with them before? Uh, this is the first time that uh, we've worked with them. Um, so we, so we originally met uh, uh, Rook and Raven, at, I, which I know you. I'm talking about Rook and Raven, not Level Up, but mm -hmm. it it circles back. I promise. Um, so we first met uh, Rook and Raven at Paxu. Because their booth was quite literally right across from ours, and they were just uh, super cool people, and we, you know, kind of like made friends with them and stuff. And then when uh, when we met back up at uh, C two E two, uh, they were hanging out with the crew from Level Up Dice and Wormwood. So I, you know, ended up by proxy hanging out with. Uh, to level up in the Wormwood crew and, you know, kind of like making some friendships there. And uh, that led to some opportunities for um, add-ons for Wormwood Dice Vaults, uh, Rook and Raven uh, character journals, and uh, level up premium dice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, to, to, that, to that end, one of the other things I was curious about is when it comes to reference cards and uh, monster cards, which are which both are um, add-ons in, in this, mm -hmm. um, they're referred to as tarot size, and I've seen tarot car tarot card decks of different sizes. And as somebody who's da who's dabbled in tarot reading him himself, although um, I'm not going to don't don't come to me for any um, predictions because I'm because I because of my predictions when it comes to sports or any indication. Um, not a good idea, <laughs> um, but I've seen them in. Di I've seen different card sizes. So, what dimensions are you, are you referring to when you talk about this being tarot size? Okay, that's going to be the uh, quote unquote standard tarot size, which is uh, seven centimeters by twelve centimeters, or two and three quarters inches by four and three quarters inches. All right. Mm -hmm. Um. What was that? Was that the size that you had that had been decided that had been decided on early on, or was there a notion to make it um, the si more of a standard playing card size at some point? Uh, there was a brief debate ab between the the two sizes, and we we've just realized that the standard the standard like playing card, you know, like a Magic the Gathering card or whatnot, is just a little too small to include a lot of the really important information. Um, on, you know, a monster or a spell and things like that. Because, I mean, there's plenty of spells that are short in length. There's plenty of monsters that are fairly simple and straightforward. But the second you have one that's a little bit wordy, uh, it becomes very difficult to fit all of that on a, on a playing card. I can, just, I can especially uh, see that at high levels. Exactly. So we, we didn't want um, that to be a you know, issue with limiting what we would be able to accommodate. Um, and that's what led to the, the tarot size, because it gives us a, just a little bit more room to put all of the things we need to on these. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, when it, now, um, 
when it comes to when it comes to when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to those which which came for which came first as far as far as putting it as far as putting it out there were the uh, reference or the monster cards um i'm not sure which came first that's actually a really good question um because we we knew we wanted to do both for the longest time um and it was just a matter of kind of like figuring out uh how we can afford mm -hmm. to uh get those things produced yeah. because you know it's like it's a bit, you know manufacturing costs are a very real and limiting thing and um, we we always knew that monster cards would be the most the more expensive of the two, mm -hmm. because you know monster cards we, I mean you could get away with doing no art, but should you no like if you're gonna do monster cards you gotta have tons of art, um, in my opinion. Yeah. So the reference cards you know those those things having art for spells and uh, all of that is nice not nearly as important um which is why those were unlocked first it's they're going to be cheaper to make um you know on a completely pragmatic level mm -hmm. um whereas the monster cards you know there's we do have a lot of monster art already in in dark matter but ultimately there's there's still a lot of monsters that don't have art and that was something that we knew would wouldn't be cheap uh to get all of that art made and so that was a big, uh, a big push for making that such a high stretch, uh, stretch goal. Even though we probably came up with, if I had to pick which one I think came first, I would say monsters were the first ones we thought of wanting to do. I, um, given yeah. the, um, given what happened with the with the with the um, stat block incident, I can certainly see why that would why that would come first. Um, the stat block incident. Um. This was this was a thing that happened about a year ago. Um, mm -hmm. It was when it was when Frylock put out those one-stop stat blocks, and somebody from Wizards of the Coast tried to stop him, and it backfired hard because the, because um, Frylock is a uh, is an IP lawyer who's oh. represented game companies for years, and he pointed out all all because um, the Wizards representative had claimed that the that the entirety of the text within the within the books because all that he all that he did was just put out the actual stats and took and took out the fluff. Mm -hmm. Um and the wizards representative tried to say that that because it was still from the books, it was inherently copyrightable. Mm -hmm. Um and he he laid I'll I'll try and I'll try and if you're curious, I might I might send you the the links, but it's a very it's a very long series of articles, but he does point out why there would be no case. Mhm. Mm um, not in a sort, not in a sort of legal advice sense, but more of if if we were talking trademark, then maybe. But copyright, you can't copyright mechanics. Yeah. Um, tap tapping in Magic: The Gathering, which incidentally is a stupid thing to trademark, is a trademark, not a uh, copyright. Mm -hmm. Trying to copyright it would run into um a pro a problem called genericide. Yeah. Um, now obviously I'm a poor, I'm a poor layman when it comes to these kind of things, but that, that was what my research had led me to mm -hmm. the, um, but I, but there's always been an, there's, but the reason I bring that kind of thing up is that there's always been a desire to have the, to have the ability to look up what a monster can do quickly, mm -hmm. um, especially with the, especially with the more complex monsters and the more complex encounters where you're, where the GM is managing multiple monsters at once. Mm -hmm. Um, which to that end, I'd like to shift a bit into, and ask a bit of a question about the GM screen. That's going to be an add on for this. Okay. Now, how similar or different is that GM screen compared to the standard one? Well, uh, this one is only going to be three panels and, um, uh... Uh, that that has a bit to do with the decision on the uh, art uh, that we wanted to do because when you do four panels, uh, in you know like the focus of the art ends up in kind of a weird place. Um, so we ended up only doing three uh, three panels, which means that we had to compress things a bit. 
Now, uh, there's a few things that we uh, took off the original uh, a GM screen, one for accommodation and two to make room for uh, some important dark matter uh, rules and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But um, a lot, if you're familiar with the Dungeon Master Reincarnated, uh, I'm not going to say it's exactly the same. Uh, obviously, it's it's not, but you're you're going to find similarities um, in the material that's presented there uh, with some with some extra uh, dark matter stuff and some of the more sur- uh, some of the more superfluous that yeah, some of the less important stuff. Since I can't use I words right the, now, um, yes, that's what I'm trying did, to and trying and desperately failing to say. <laughs> did you learn to Did you learn to speak English good at school? Um, you know, I'm actually a uh, communications major, so you'd think I'd be able to enunciate my words properly. Oh, could, but could have uh, fooled me. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, 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 <laughs> it, I I talk on the phone at my day job eight hours a day, so by the time I get into a lot of these interviews, my my brain and my tongue are, are just done. <laughs> if it if it if it's any if it's any consolation, um, ev I you are you are not I am not singling you out because um mm-hmm. every Eng, every English teacher that I ever had I would give them hell whenever I saw a typo in their assignments. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there and one and in one of the worst instances I um turned in an assignment that was due on April Fool's Day, but I I had it mirror written. And this was oh, eight no. pages long. Oh no, that's that's too much. No. Well then, don't, well then, don't put it. Then don't have April Fool's Day as the due date. I mean, like fair, but oh man, uh, that's that's so evil. I had I had already had like it. I I remember looking at the due date and I'm, I'm like, you sh- you sure you want to have that as the due date? And he was like, yeah. Okay, <laughs> like you get you get you get exact you get exactly what you got coming if that's what you're gonna do. Yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they they should have considered the inevitable, uh, you know, class class pranks on April Fools, uh, mm-hmm. especially with the big assignments. Yeah, I'm guess I'm guessing it's a case of thinking that nobody'd be crazy enough to do it, but um. The way to win is to do what any what everyone else won't. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm I'm certain that the the uh, teacher would have never saw that coming. Well, he um he was giving me the stink eye for the next for the next month, so <laughs> that that yeah. and ref- that and when he finally did, when he, I ended up getting an A on it, but he but he wrote in he wrote in big red ink, never do this again. <laughs> uh yes. yeah i mean i admittedly probably wouldn't have been so merciful so uh good on him for you know playing along or kind of accepting his his mistake mm. <laughs> there it's, at by that point i already had a, i already had a reputation of being i think as one person put it brilliant but an asshole ah <laughs> uh, okay <laughs> Like I, I'm, I'm the I'm the kind of person who would um, who would tr- who would who would put out signs for free T-shirts, but if you followed the signs directions, you'd be driving in circles. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so that so um and every everybody more or less knew about that kind of thing, so it's not it's not like this was some surprise. Mm-hmm. Um, but when, but what? Now, when it came when it came to the Kickstarter for just Dark Matter versus this uh, starter versus the starter set, what would you say have have been some of the takeaways in the interim, aside from having good social media? I think we, I think we've made that clear. Yeah, I mean, so obviously, yeah, the social media is in very very important. Uh, the other thing is having a marketing budget helps a lot. Uh, we I was given a thousand dollars. To to you know like sponsor streams, uh, pay for ads, things like that. Mm-hmm. And you just you can't do a whole lot with a thousand dollars, unfortunately. And uh, so having a marketing budget can really really change things. 
Um, it's not the end all be all. If you don't have a marketing budget, there are ways around it. You just have to work harder. Um, but uh, another thing is the importance of having uh, physical product, plural. Uh, so the, the first Dark Matter Kickstarter, the, the only product that was being given out was the, the Dark Matter uh, kick, the Dark Matter core book itself. Whereas with this, between the different add-ons and uh, different uh, tiers and stuff that you can get, uh, there's a lot more uh, physical things being offered here. And so, like, we, we have, like, about three times as many backers as we had last time. But we're also sitting around five times more made than last time because each person is spending, you know, there's more dollars spent per, um, more dollars spent per person. And that, that allows, you know, us to go further in terms of like more ambitious, uh, projects and stretch goals and, um, things like that, because we have all of these different physical offerings that we wouldn't have been able to do if it was just the starter kit or just the core book. And, you know, we hadn't partnered for cool dice and, and all that stuff. Um, so if you're going to make a Kickstarter, uh, try and have a couple different physical products and that'll really help it, you know, uh, go further than it would otherwise. Something that I've noticed with the Kickstarters that tend to do better than others is that mm-hmm. they tend is that they tend to have some sort of um, some sort of demo, um, mm-hmm. whether whether it be whether it be a live play in the case of um, in the case of board in the case of board games or a mm-hmm. um, or or just a just a preview version in PDF form when it comes to um, RPGs, um, mm-hmm. just some just something so that people can get kind of an idea of what they're getting into. Mm-hmm. Is you can you can write a you can write a detailed um, description, but the thing the thing is that's only going to work up to a point. Is mm-hmm. what is what I've seen. Maybe you've um, maybe you've seen something similar in in that regard, where yeah, th- where um, and it's got where you're get where you're going to have a better impact when people actually have and have a fit have a not physical but digital idea. I guess I'll say. Mm-hmm. of what they're of what they're dealing with yeah ex- I, you you've nailed it on the head like so both the original and this one uh, we included a starter kit or sorry a, a demo a demo uh, of everything and uh you know i think i think the demo that we offered this time around offered uh more material than the first one but uh you know, uh, you know, you mentioned live plays. You know, one of the biggest things that we sponsor is is Twitch streams and podcasts and things like that, where people can see how Dark Matter plays um, in comparison to you know your standard D anD D or whatever their preferred you know RPG is. So that like that's something that we've always made sure to include uh, in in the uh, Kickstarters. I mean that we've done. So yeah, I mean like absolutely do that because uh, I mean, especially if, if no one's ever heard of like, there's plenty of people that still haven't heard of Matrix press. I'm sure. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we have 2000 backers this time around. I'm pretty sure more than 2000 people play uh, five. Um, well, you know, the, these, these demos give us chance to sh- prove that we know what we're doing um, in addition to how it plays because there are a million and a half people writing uh, Dungeons and Dragons 5e material. Uh, some are good, some aren't. Uh, some people have not gotten the credit and recognition they deserve because you know it's it's hard to find um, you know every, you know all the good stuff when it's surrounded by uh, just so much other stuff. Um, and that's you know not to speak poorly of anyone who's who's uh, putting a, their best foot forward to design a, things, but there's also things that are worth more than others, you know, just inherently, uh, in terms of like uh, quality. Are you familiar with Sturgeon's Law? Hmm? Um, are you familiar? Um, Sturgeon's Law is that? Have you ever heard of that? 
Uh, it's a new one for me. Um, and anything, anything can be art, but ninety percent of art is crap. Uh, yeah, I mean, like it's definitely a uh, you know pretty blunt way to put it, but yeah, exactly. So you can, you know, unfortunately, like not everyone fully understands, you know, uh, the like a lot of people, you know, that are designing for uh, TTRPGs and, and Dungeons and Dragons, mm -hmm. uh, they understand the game very well. But they might, they may or may not understand the principles behind the game design. Like for example, uh, the the barbarian gets two rages a day from the start. Now, mathematically, that's actually overpowered. But the reason why they included that was because you have like the the fallacy of like you know uh, I can't spend this because it's it's too good to use. I need to save this for later. So they yeah, gave the, the rainy they day. Gave the world exactly. So they gave the warlock two spells right from the get-go, um, and the barbarian two rages uh, per day. Not because that's what they should have gotten mathematically, but because that ensured that people would actually use their class features and actually have fun playing the game. Mm -hmm. um, I um, I do think that more. I do think that more tabletop RPGs should um, should put out. I'm not saying I'm not saying that this should be a paid book. Maybe it can just be a free PDF that's only like twelve pages or something, but some sort mm -hmm. of for lack of a better term, hacker's guide. Um Well, uh they have done this partially. Um in terms of like, you know, Wizards has released uh, the style guides for all of the D and D's uh all of the Dungeons and Dragons books uh on the DMs Guild for free. Um and so if you're wanting to know how you should, you know, phrase things, how you should word things, um, and things like that, you should absolutely be downloading those. And that's another issue with a lot of people designing uh, for 5e specifically is there's this free resource that tells you exactly how you should phrase certain sentences. And uh, either people aren't aware that the style guide is available or they're opting not to use it. Um, one of the two. Now, don't get me wrong. It's a it's a dense and boring read because it's just telling you write things this way, write things that way. Uh, um, that, but it's an incredibly useful resource if you're wanting to, you know, make your books as um, proper as possible. It's one of it's one of those. It's when it comes when it comes to something like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's more. I think it. I think it's more likely that people just aren't aware of it. Yeah, I, I would imagine usually the not aware of it uh, thing. But that's one of the first things that I I give people advice on when they ask, hey, if I want to start selling my stuff, um, what is the first thing I need to do? And my answer is always um, download the style guides, read those and understand them, and like make sure that whatever you're releasing matches those. Mm -hmm. Because... When when people are used to the wording being a certain way, and then you switch up on it, like you might release something that's very good, but then it just people either have trouble grasping it, or um, or people don't just inherently just kind of like uh, react negatively to it, not because it's bad or unbalanced, but simply the wording doesn't use the quote unquote uh, proper wording. Um, as silly as that may or may not sound. And, like, that's, again, you know, like, there's there's a lot of people that are doing this right, a lot of people that are doing an excellent job of following these formats and uh, making sure that things are balanced. Uh, and then there's a lot of people that aren't. Um, and that's kind of where, where you have to start digging in and figuring out uh, how to do things, quote-unquote, the right way. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now with now with that said, now with now um you've got six days to go and you've and you've managed to completely shatter the um initial goal. In fact actually I have to I have to correct what I was about to say because just as I was about to say the current amount it ended up updating again. <laughs> <laughs> so let me get this out of the way before I end up putting my foot in my mouth twice. 
Um, it's at one ninety two thousand six hundred thirty three. Um, mm -hmm. Now, once once kick once all the paperwork is de is dealt with, what are you aiming for as far as the release date? Are you thinking December? Or are you thinking early twenty twenty one? So, are we talking physical or digital? Um, because of, because of because of what we what we in the temple call the B three, i.e., beer bug bullshit. Mm -hmm. Um, let's go, let's go with digital for the sake of this. Okay. Digital. Um, uh, by the end of September, everything, all of the digital files should be done. All right. I'd, well, I'd... uh, not, not counting rule 20 if, mm -hmm. if we, uh, if we hit that, uh, cause that's going to be a whole process, but, um, the, the core book will be updated with the new errata that's being, uh, released. And uh, Conspiracy in the Stars is already written, and we're just missing the art for one map. Um, so we just we just need a couple more things, and we're and we're done uh, with with these digital files. And so then, once we're done with those, then we'll move on to getting these books to the printers, and we'll be. Uh, hopefully getting those in everyone's hands no later than uh, February. Uh, all right. I, get... <laughs> I can, I can, and I'll definitely be looking forward to that. Um, mm -hmm. With that said, I do want to, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your, out of your schedule and, um, and and having argue, having arguments between your brain and and your and your tongue, as you mentioned earlier, um, <laughs> to to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. Um, yeah. And any, anytime you see fit to return, even if it's just one giant shit post of, about <laughs> about why no about why nobody should why nobody should play Star Packed Warlocks. Um, <laughs> feel feel <laughs> feel free to your the door is always open. Um, well, thank you. As we, as we always say, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Mm -hmm. Especially even, unless you're a wizard who throws fireball, because fireball throwing wizards are ba are banned from the drinking room. Hey, so are, are how familiar with our catalog are you? Out of curiosity, um, I'm familiar with the. I've I think I think I've got a. I think I've got a, I think I've got a few, although I haven't had the time to do a deep dive. Um, I just like I just I just like making well, those kind of jokes. Oh no, absolutely. Well, the reason I'm curious is we have a um, we have a subclass called the sorcerer in taverns and tankards, which is a alcohol powered sorcerer. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might appreciate that. Well, given how given how many times I've played drunken fist characters over the years, I'm perfectly fine with that. <laughs> And the fact, especially since um, when I was running Tomb of Horrors, I ha I had a rule that anytime your character died, you had to take a shot. Oh, jeez. I mean they they'd come they'd come back they'd come back after about a minute, but um, you still you still had to you still had to drink. If you mm -hmm. got caught cheating, then you'd have to drink the pain glass. The pain oh, no. glass. Is I, a, I have a... It is a shot glass full of black pepper, salt. Sea salt, Tabasco, Frank's red hot sauce, tiger sauce, and vinegar. Not the way I thought that was going to go, but um, that sounds pretty awful. Well, it's <laughs> that's why it's called the pain glass. If I'm going to call it that, I yeah. better deliver. Yeah, I was expecting it to be uh, kind of like the uh, in King's Cup, where you know you kind of like start dumping a bunch of extra, you know, alcohol. Uh, into one glass, and it starts to become this unholy am amalgamation of, you know, beer and vodka and you know tequila and you know whatever else everyone's drinking. Mm -hmm. I, I thought you were going to go uh, that route with the pain. No, 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 no. I'm trying to cause pain, not death. Yeah, fair. <laughs> I'm not sure which one. I, if I had to pick between the two, I'm not sure which one I would pick. <laughs> well, option option C is drink a bottle of bacon soda. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Nobody take nobody takes option C. No, I don't think I would. No. 
Because it's exactly what it's it's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> mm-hmm. But but yeah but yeah even if even if coming even if it's just coming back for um, shit posting, um, the door is always open. And well, I know somebody you. might say, "Well, how how do how you're a monk? How 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 can you possibly be drinking? Um, what do you think they do in the mon- What do you think they do in a monastery in the middle of bumfuck nowhere? <laughs> Besides, there's 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 sects like the uh, Trappists that brew their own beer. Mm-hmm. So it's not out, it's not as out of the ordinary as some people think. Um, yeah. And of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the insanity. And there will be more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>